everyone. I'd like to share to you a story. I don't know if it's familiar with you, but it's a story that's kind of, for me, even as I read it, it's kind of a disturbing story. It's a difficult story to tell. And so we're going to wrestle this morning with a difficult story. And this is, of course, the story of David and the incident that resulted in the death of one person and the frenzied dancing of another. Let's look at um, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. It is a story that is, uh, I guess, well told. It's, uh, and, and we're looking at it uh, this morning. I, but I promise that as we allow the story to tell itself, and as we connect with it, with the larger story of the Bible and the good news of Jesus Christ, we will find some powerful principles for everyone else here in this morning. Pastor Joe in his, uh, has been talking to us in his beautiful uh, messages, inspiring messages about the grace of God and the, and the blessings that we have now received because Christ is in us, the hope of glory. And so we'll connect that uh, to the story of David. The story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 6. On the surface, the story goes like this. It's a, I'll, I'll give you a paraphrase of some sort. Um, after seven years of brutal civil war, King Saul was, uh, was, was, was finally ki was killed in the battle. And as God promised, as God has prophesied early on in the life of this young man, David, finally David has been crowned king of Israel as, a, at, as it has been prophesied. So finally, the long battle, the long drawn out battle for, 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 for the throne is... Uh, over. David is now king. One of his first acts as king is to decide to bring the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is a powerful religious symbol for the entire nation. It is an important uh, piece of a religious uh, um, uh, symbol for the nation. And he wants to bring it back to Jerusalem. Um, backtrack a little bit. Why was it outside Jerusalem, you might ask? What happened, Pastor Bong? 20 years before this time, 20 years before David decides to uh, bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, the Philistines have captured the Ark in a battle. And they carried it with them. However, of course, uh, God's anger was upon the Philistines for desecrating the Ark of the Covenant. And it brought them so much stress and judgment that they put it on an ox cart and pointed it to the direction of Jerusalem and let it go. They couldn't handle it. It's, you know, too many things are happening and they said, we have to let this go. And so they put it on an ox cart and they say, oh, you know, just go, leave, so that it, the Ark of the Covenant is no longer with them. So for 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant has been stashed in a remote ear area at the house of a man named Abinadab. So it has been there smoldering and maybe forgotten. In verse 1, chapter 2, uh, in verse 1 of uh, uh, two, Second Samuel chapter 6, we read that 30,000 armed soldiers showed up at Abinadab's front door and asked for the ark. It was the king who decreed that the ark will be taken out of storage and finally be brought back into Jerusalem. As it had been a curse, Abinadab released the ark gladly, saying, you go get it. You know, please bring it out and bring it to Jerusalem. I no longer want it. And so they put it on an ox cart. And as the Israelites moved the ark on an ox cart, a karatela siguro, uh, in, our, in our context, as they were journeying, and at this time there were no super highways yet, the roads are kind of, you know, bumpy and all that, that oxen stumbled. Nadasma siguro ang cow, ang ox. The ox stumbled. And precariously, the, the Ark of the Covenant began to fall. 
In an effort to save and to steady the, the ark that was about to topple, Uzzah, the high priest that was, who was leading the, the parade going to Jerusalem, reached out to steady the ark. And because of that, he dropped dead on the spot. Grim events. You know, it was supposed to be a celebration, and yet a tragedy happened. The party was over, and everyone went home. David was, of course, you know, he was afraid, and he was scared, and he was kind of bothered. He asked, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He asked. The ark went home to a man, to, to, uh, went to the home of a man named Obed-Edom. And as a result of him bring, taking in the Ark of the Covenant, God blessed this man and his entire family. Three months later, David tries to get the Ark back again. His overwhelming desire is to bring this, this, this uh, symbol, this Ark of the Covenant to the, to the city. And so he tries again after three months. This time, the party went as planned. There was even more joy in the movement of the Ark. And it is in this incident that David danced with all his might. You know, he danced so much that, as, they, uh, as, as the story will tell us, you know, uh, he removed his clothing and he was left with his, I guess, the equivalent of a boxer short. You know, he was just dancing in his undies. Because he was, you know, he was frenzied, he was flailing about, he was just dancing wildly uh, before the Ark of the Covenant. It's a story that's kind of a little weird. I don't know if every time I read it, I kind of, you know, sense that there was, you know, some undercurrent of things here that's kind of difficult to understand. And to be perfectly honest, this kind of a story makes some people not believe in the Bible because they will say, oh, look at that, God is pictured here as a vindictive, tick-off, unfair, mean mean God. I mean, how, how could he do that to a man who only meant good? He wanted to save the ark and then he was killed. Or if you believe the Bible, this kind of a story seems to create fear and insecurity in our relationship with God because it brings fear. Naku, what if I do something that displeases the Lord? Will I be struck dead? Will I be stricken dead? Will I be smitten? Tama bang word smitten? Smote. Will, I be, will God smite me? Right? We have this idea that, you know, if, you know, this, this kind of a relationship with God is a scary one because God could get angry at any time. And if God gets angry, he will send his bolt of lightning and he will just strike me dead. Right? The Bible tells us that, you know, the Apostle Paul tells us that the relationship with God is a, a relationship that is love and acceptance. Romans 8, chapter 16 tells us, For you did not receive the spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship, and by him we cry out, Abba, Father. And so this relationship with God being vindictive and mean and, and out to punish us with a quick death, you know, seems a little bit disturbing. How can we experience this level of intimacy and security and safety with God? This story seems to tell us that we better watch out. Because God is just watching over you like a hawk. And the moment you mess up, he is quick with the whip or he's quick with the punishment and you're dead. Right? This seems to be the picture here. This story raises many questions. You know, what's the big deal with the ark, for example, and why did David want it? Second question, why did God smite Uzzah? Number three, why did God, why did David dance before the Lord with all his might? Why did all his, his joy seep out of his heart and his body? And what difference does any of this make in my life right here, right now? It's 2017. A lot of things are happening right now. Diba? There's that crisis at the resource world, and there's one going on in, in Marawi and all of that. What's that got to do with me right now? These are tough questions. And in order for us to 
understand the story, we need to go back to the context of the story. Part of the problem in reading this story, or any biblical story for that matter, is that we lack context. Context makes all the difference. It explains to us a lot of things because if you look at it as just one incident, then you know it can get out of it can be blown out of proportion and it can be taken out of the you know the storyline. And so in, in, in the same way we need to understand the context of David's story. So let's slowly piece by piece um, look at some of the key elements here and of the story. Number one is the question. What was the ark? And why did David want it? The ark is, the ark of the covenant is a box, a chest. Uh, four feet in length, two feet in width, and two feet in depth. Overlaid with gold. The solid gold lid, and on top of it is called the mercy seat. Okay? The first time I ever encountered the Ark of the Covenant is from the movie Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember that's, that movie? Or are you too young to remember that movie? Uh, Harrison Ford, diba? Indiana Jones and uh, the German Nazi was looking for the Ark of the Covenant because it was going to be used as the weapon of mass destruction and all that. And so Indiana Jones had to fight them off and to find it before they did. And the Ark of the Covenant was a weapon of mass destruction, according to them. Uh, remember the melting face of that Nazi uh, soldier who, when he opened the lid and the face just melted? Diba? So this was my first idea of uh, the Ark of the Covenant. However, that is not what the Ark of the Covenant is. Unlike the Ark of the Covenant in Indiana Jones... The Ark of the Covenant did not have magical properties. You know, it's not a weapon of mass destruction. You know, people got in big trouble when they tried to use it like a spell or a charm. More than anything, the Ark of the Covenant is... It symbolizes something for the ancient followers of Yahweh. In the same way that we celebrate the Lord's Supper to remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and His abiding presence in our midst, the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol, a reminder, a visual reminder for the people of Israel that God was with them. That the presence of God was available. That there was a gap between man and God because of our sin, because of His, of his holiness. There is a gap and yet God has transcended that gap. And now He is available. He is here in our midst. That was a reminder for the people of Israel at the time. After delivering Israel from slavery and making a covenant with them, God instructed them to make an ark and said, There I will meet you. So that ark was a place of intimacy, a place symbolizing, representing the presence of God. It is a visual reminder that God was with them, that God is not far away, that He is with them, that there is a, there is a place of closeness between God and His people. It was a place where the glory literally means the heaviness, the weightiness, the experiential reality of God dwelling among them. That God was there and they felt it, they see it, they live in that glory, they live in that mercy. And every day in their lives, because the Ark of the Covenant was there, it reminded them, God is here, God is present. And all this intimacy, living in the glory of God, living in the vital relationship with God, was purely God's initiative, God's gift of radical, free Grace. We have been discovering this uh, for a few weeks already. And this is it. Be not because Israel earned it. Not because Israel deserved it. But because God in His grace and in His mercy took the initiative. Because He wants to bless the people. 
And so this is why David wanted the ark so badly. This is the reason why God, uh, David wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be back in the city where he reigns. David wanted the Ark so badly. Yes, he may have wanted it for political reasons. He wanted to reunite the country because it was still in turmoil and everything and that could be seen as a political move. But more than that, I think there was a deeper reason for, uh, for David wanting, needing the Ark of the Covenant be brought back, be brought back into Jerusalem. Because more than anything, while David is a politician, you know, David is uh, is uh, has uh, has to influence his people. More than anything, above all of that, we also know that David hungered for intimacy with God. This was his utmost desire. This was his deepest prayers. To be with God, to experience the presence of God every day. Listen to his prayer in Psalm 27 verse 4. One thing I ask of the Lord. One thing I ask of the Lord. And this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. So yeah, more than anything, wealth, power dynasty, whatever of the so more than anything, this is what I desire. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. This was the cry of David's heart. To know God. No? Not just data about God. Not just facts about God. But to live intimately with God. To experience God in a real in, in, in real time. In, in a way that is, you know, immediate and there. To have the kind of a relationship that Apostle Paul talked about in which we cry out, Abba, Father. That's, you know, I'm going to close. The ark represented that spiritual reality. You know, and that is what he wanted. It's one thing to know facts about God. You know, God loves me. My sins are forgiven. God is for me. We have heard that so many times. Preached to us. We read it in books. You know, it's told to us in our Bible studies. All of these things. We know that. It's a, it's a truth that we, we, we know. Uh, you know, it's one thing to know about it. It's another to have that reality come alive in your hearts. To feel the weight. To feel the weight of it pressing on your life, to have God's love and presence and power governing your life more than anything. What? It's, 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 there's a difference there. You know that ice cream is delicious, but once you taste it, you know, it's, it's different, right? It's one thing to know about the love of God, it's another thing to experience it, to feel it. It doesn't matter what others think or how well you perform or whether you fail or you succeed because God is more real than the opinions of others. And so this is the reason why David wanted the ark because it represented that intimacy with God, that security. He needed it. Let me amend that. He desperately needed. He would need it every day of his life. He needed a joy and a security that is deeper than his circumstances. He hungered for the intimacy of God, and that's why he was desperate to have the Ark of the Covenant come back to Jerusalem so that they would be reminded once more that God's presence was with them. However, something went wrong. Along the way, the oxen stumbled. The Ark of the Covenant threatened to topple. And in his, I guess, goodness and, mo and, 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 and good motives, Uzzah wanted to save the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant and reach out to steady it. But instead, he, instead of being appreciated, he dropped dead. Kind of a disturbing story. Right? Context will tell us, will help us better understand why 
Pusa have to die. In the Bible, Exodus chapter 25 verses 12 to 14 God has made it very clear that there were certain rules for moving the ark. He was very specific. God was very specific on how to move the covenant, uh, the ark of the covenant. God said it must be carried. It must be carried. That's why, if you look back at the, uh, the picture, uh, there are carrying poles around it. They are fitted with rings and poles. It is meant to be carried by people, not put on a caratella driven by an ox. It was meant to be carried. Not only that, it had to be carried by, not just by anyone, it was to be carried by a group of people called the Korahites. The Korahites are a special breed of people, a special uh, group, though I, I would say uh, though SAF, though uh, Green Beret, though Marines, though Navy SEALs, of uh, a group called the Levites, a special priestly class of the people. So they were um, set apart for this purpose alone. And I'm sure they must be strong because it's a heavy, it's, it's a heavy box, so I guess they would be building their muscles because at any time they would be asked to carry the, that, that heavy box. So it was supposed to be carried by a group of people called the Korahites. So it was not meant to be carried by an ox or put in an ox cart. Third, very specific, God said no one was to touch it. So the people in that parade that David sent disregarded every single rule, all of that. They disobeyed God by putting it on an ox, oxen. They disobeyed God because they not, they, it was not carried by the uh, Korahites. And it was also a violation in that who's that trying to touch it. However, the question is, is that why God, is that the reason why God smote Uzzah? Because he broke the rules, right? Is this the reason why? If that's the case, we'll probably say, that's why I don't believe in God, because, you know, it's just a bunch of rules, and I don't want rules in my life. Or, that's why I could never be close to God, because I don't know when I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll offend God and he'll just strike me dead, and it's, it's dangerous. So I'd rather not be close to God. He's just waiting for me to break the rules and then wham, like that. God will zap me with really with something really terrible. That God is quick with the whip or God is quick with the punishment. It's, you know, God will just inflict pain because he's displeased. Many of us live with deep-seated dread that our relationship with God is based on keeping the rules. And we know for a fact that we break the rules every day. We need to understand that breaking the rules is just a symptom. The rules are all about God and our relationship with God. The rules say that there is something unique about God. The rules tell us that God is totally different from us, that He is holy. That means that there is a separation, there is a gap, there is a chasm between us and God. That we could not approach God in any other way because there is no way to approach God. He is far away from us. There is a, there is a gap that separates us. Our sin has separated us from God. There is a chasm between God and us. A huge, uncrossable, unbridgeable gap. You cannot bridge it. You cannot do anything so that you can go over there and approach God. You cannot say, oh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm a good person, I do nice things, I tithe 11%, I go to church, I'm righteous, I'm moral, I help God out. So God owes me. You cannot do that. That's the Uza approach to God, and this is why God was displeased. Uza was not evil, but he certainly was not innocent either. 
God did not smite him for just one petty rule violation. As Eugene Peterson said, Uzzah's death was not sudden. It was years in the making. Touching the ark was the final straw, not the singular sin. Was God harsh and mean with Uzzah? Of course not. God is just. But for years, God has chosen to forgo His justice and extended mercy to Uzzah. To Uzzah. Uzzah knew all about the holiness of God. He should know. He is the high priest. He should know. He was raised, he was trained as a Korahite. Of all the people that that should know about the holiness of God, it is this group of people. Uzzah knew that you cannot come crashing into God's presence, nor can can you work your way into God's presence by being a good and moral person. But he decided to ignore what he knew and loaded the ark onto the ox cart. Why? Because in his mind, he knew better than God. Lord, primitive din ang magkarga-karga. Can you imagine the distance between this and Jerusalem? Let me give you a better idea, Lord. Let me advise you. Here is a better way. This is the latest fashion in, in art traveling. You know? Let me suggest to you an oxen uh, uh, cart to carry it. In his mind, he knew better than God. Then he thought that he, do, he, he will do God a favor by adjusting the ark just as he started to fall. He believed that God needed his help. He believed that he could manage and control God. God said, don't touch the ark because my holiness dwells in the ark. If you touch it, you will die. I exempt siguro ko, Lord, kay I am a good person. I can do this. I can violate it. The Lord did not warn the people about the ark falling, touching the earth. There's nothing wrong with the soil. Soil does exactly what God created it to do. However, we as human beings do not. We don't live the way God intended us to live with absolute love, integrity, and trust. We've committed rebellion, cosmic treason against God. The soil has not, no problem. The holiness of God. God's Holiness was belittled by Uzzah. Uzzah. Uzzah's entire life belittled God's holiness. If we start to believe that we can manage God through our religious behavior, if we think that we can blackmail God by our contributions, by our lives, then we have another thing coming. If we believe that we can manage God through our religious behavior or through our moral efforts, we will assume that God owes us, that God is on our side, and that we take care of God, not vice versa. Uzzah was struck dead. There is a gap. We can never go near God. But God has a solution. Solution of radical grace. We'll talk about that later. So, the question was God being mean and vindictive with Uzzah? Certainly not. For years, God has extended mercy to this man. According to uh, Tim Keller, an Uzzah like approach to God can happen to us as well when we think we are we earn God's presence and now God owes us and it leads us to three paths when we begin to act like Uzzah number one we grow cold and proud because you know Lord you owe me I've given so much I've done this I've done that you know you owe me Lord kung ay sa akin you know this kingdom would not have been built or this thing has not, could not have been done because of me. Right? We believe we've earned God's presence so we must be better than those around us and so we become proud. We attempt to manage God. We've helped God. 
So we must run the universe and our lives in the way we think He should. We are like consultants now to God, and we tell Him what to do, and God obeys. That is like a waiter. Lord, do this, do that. Lord, I command you to do this or to do that. Right? When we suffer, then we then get bitter and resentful. Number three, we realize that we cannot earn God's presence because we keep messing up and falling into habitual sin and we live with shame and guilt. Spiritual pride, confusion, and bitterness, shame and guilt, we see these attitudes everywhere. We're more like Uza than we'd like to admit. Uza's approach to spiritual life is lethal. It is deadly. It kills the spirit. It kills our relationship with God. Someone said Uza was dead before he touched the ark. He died spiritually the moment he thought he could keep God safely in a box. And so God interrupted the parade and tried to wake up the entire nation. In that dangerous journey, David, however, could not be stopped. David tries to bring back the ark once more. David lips and twirls and shimmies wild limb into the air, dancing in desperation for the Lord. Let me give you a little background as well about David. When the story unfolds before us, David was no longer the young man that he was when he was prophesied to be king. Years have already passed. He might be close to 40 or more than 40 years old already at this time. So he is now middle-aged. He's not, he's not the young, uh, energetic, brass young man that he was. You know, uh, dodging the, the spear that Saul would throw at him. He was this dignified king already. He was close to 40. Maybe his wound haunted flesh, trained for war, hardened through exile dwelling, borderline skirmishes, and soul dodging has already softened. He does not have to get his bread by begging anymore. He does not have to fake insanity just to earn the sympathy and food. He is lord of the land already. He is king. Years of austerity and hardship have given way to a long season of prosperity and luxury and ease. So David has now been transformed. He's no longer the ragged young man that he was. He was now elegant, dignified, sophisticated, kingly. So, you know, there is a transformation already taking place. And this is perhaps what can be used to describe King David. Dignified, elegant, sophisticated. But today, he dances near naked with all his might, undignified. So the question is, why did David dance with all his might? What was the reason? David wakes up and become and becomes alive to the reality of the of the separation of that chasm. He understands it. How can the ark of the Lord come to me? He cries out in verse 9. He understands that there is a separation, that we are far away from God, that He is far away from God. He understands that God is holy and we are flawed and sinful. He understands the bad news of the gospel, that we are far worse off than we would ever dare to admit. The New Testament puts it this way, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's us. This is our status. This is where we are. We are far away from God. That's the bad news. So why did David wind up dancing with all his might? Why did David start the party again, strip down to his, I guess, boxer shorts is the equivalent, and go wild with crazy knee slapping, God exalting, song raising, shouting dance of praise to God. Why? Because David did not just understand that there is a separation between us and God, the bad news. He also understands that God's mercy and radical grace has made available so that we can cross the gap. That God has taken the initiative so that we can experience closeness and intimacy with God. Yes, we are separated, but that is no longer 
the reality. The reality now is that as God has drawn near, God has taken the initiative and drawn near to us. We see a small taste of this in the grace of this grace in the little episode with Obed Edom. After Uzzah dropped dead and the party ended, the ark wound up in Obed Edom's house. We know nothing about this man except that he is a Gittite. Which means he's a foreigner. He's not one of the twelve tribes. He's not part of the. He's not an Israelite. He's an outsider. After Obed Edom housed the ark for three months, God not only blessed him, but God also blessed his entire family. Why did not God smite this guy also? Why did Odem, uh, Edom, Obed Edom? You know, what did he do that was so special to have, her, to have earned him the blessings of God? One word, nothing. He did not try to manage God. He did not try to control God. He did not try to get God in his debt because he's such a good moral person. No, Obed-Edom placed his faith in the radical grace of God. Then David gets it. That's the only way to come to God, by radical grace. And he understands this, and this is the reason why he could not help himself. He lost his dignity because he wanted to express the joy of the very truth that God has made his presence available, that we can come to him. Occasionally, we get a glimpse of what might be considered the deepest reality. That we are welcome in the presence of God. That we do not have to be afraid. That we can be close to Him. When we fully grasp this extraordinary truth that God has bridged this separation, that we can bask in His presence in radical intimacy, we could not help but rejoice. And this king, half naked, whirling, leaping, he sensed it, he understood it, he felt it. There was no other reaction for him but to wildly dance in celebration. Because finally, we were separated from God. Now we are reunited. This is the reason why he danced. He knew this and he danced. Of course, I must remind you that this grace did not come cheap. It was paid for. If you remember at the Ark of the Covenant, the top, the top of it is called the Mercy Seat. Right? It's made of solid gold. And every year, the Mercy Seat was sprinkled with blood of sacrifice. This was because God wanted to show visibly, unforgettably, and graphically that forgiveness always costs something dear. It costs a life. We know this instinctively. If someone hurts you or hurts someone you love, you cannot just walk away and say, Oh, okay lang, you know, I forgive. Somehow there must be amends. An atonement, a debt must be paid. For the relationship to be restored, someone has to pay the price and bridge the separation. And here is the good news of the gospel. God was prepared to pay the price for us. We committed treason, we committed rebellion against God, but when Christ died on the cross, he bore our sin, Christ paid for our debt. David understood, or at least had a foretaste of that radical grace, which produces radical intimacy. So David danced, and he danced with all his might. He danced with reckless abandon. He danced and did not care what anyone else thought about his dancing. He danced because the glory and the presence and the grace of God was so heavy, so palpable in his life, he could feel it. He knew the weightiness of God, the glory of God, the grace of God that he did not deserve. God has bridged the gap. God saw justice and holiness of God. God woke him up. David saw the incredible radical grace of God that set his heart free. And you know what? There is a reason to rejoice every one of us because that offer of grace, that presence, that intimacy is available even today. 
That fullness has been offered to us already. Christ has paid our debt. We no longer had to carry the burdens of our sin. Do you know that? Do you feel it in your heart? Do you know that in Christ, through Christ, with Christ, every sin has been nailed to the cross? That you do not need to bear the condemnation of your sin anymore. You are free. You can approach God, the holy God, the same God that met David, the same God that struck Uzzah. You can approach that holy God and say, Father, I need you. Father, I am desperate for your presence. Father, I am hurting today. Father, I fall into sin. Help me, save me, cleanse me. And you know what? Here's the good news. He will. He will. His presence is available for all of us. In the midst of the difficulties of this life, whatever challenges we might face, whatever you know difficulties we might be facing right now as a country, as individuals, we can come to the Lord and be assured that His presence is available and is, He is with us. Amen? Father God, thank you. We were far away. We were distant. Because we know, Father God, we are stained by sin, helplessly, shamelessly. We are separated from your presence, Father God. And yet, you have taken the initiative, Father God, so that the, the gap can be bridged. So that the chasm, Father God, can be filled. So that there will no longer be any, separa any separation between you and us, Father God. You have sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that we can go to you. Lord, thank you for this privilege. Thank you, Lord God, for this fullness that we can experience intimacy with you through the radical grace that is offered to us. Lord, help us in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of the challenges that we face every day, in the midst of the things that we face, Lord God, we can come to you and we are assured, Father God, that we will be accepted. We will find acceptance, not condemnation. We will find love, not hatred. We will find, Father God, your embrace. Lord, thank you. This week, Father God, thank you. Remind us, Father God, of this privilege that we have with you right now because of your grace and because of Jesus Christ. We offer everything to you, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.